last fellow day when he was a king of prayer. Let me take a few minutes to unpack this thing. So maskal literally, literally means enlightenment. When King David wrote a maskal, it was to teach people a truth of God or a truth about God. It was to illumine the eyes and open the ears of those listening to get rare understanding. In other words, to enlighten them. When he was in a cave. So throughout history, primitive people may use some caves for shelter, for burial, as religious sites. And I was placed in caves or generally pretty well protected from weather extremes and scavenging animals. You know, caves are where they travel dead sea scrolls. They find stuff like bones and jewelry, and artwork, and pottery preserved in caves. Caves might also make good prayer closets. I mean, David wasn't stashing jewelry or scrolls, this was a prayer. If you think about it, the gloom and solitude of a cave could be helpful to the exercise of devotion, right? But what was David doing in this cave? This is the same little David that killed Goliath for King Saul. Yeah. The talented David that played the harp to calm Saul's mood swings. The fearless David who was commander over Saul's armies. This is the same David who married Saul's daughter, Michael, who protected her who protected David from her father, and the same David who was a real type of Saul's son, Jonathan, who also protected David from his father. David's popularity and success made Saul what one might refer to today as a hater. <laughs> the prayer recorded in the psalm dates from the days when Saul was after David with a vengeance. Saul wanted David dead, for real, right? After a battle with the Philistines, David was hiding in the caves at Engei, right there on the border between Israel and Jordan. Like the Taliban hiding an unmanned un un drone in the mountain caves of Tora Bora after 9-11. At one point, Saul actually entered the cave where David was hiding, but David was in such a deep, dark place in his cave that Saul couldn't even see him. Have you ever been in such a deep, dark place that you felt like nobody really saw you? Like you went into hiding for safety and ended up trapped? I have. Many of us have found ourselves seeking refuge in caves for one reason or another. People living with HIV and AIDS often face religious persecution, family expectations that they don't feel like they can meet, social and sexual stigma. All that can force folks into to seek refuge in those deep, dark places in those caves, or in the closet. Yeah. Folks who test positive for HIV have to weigh the risks of somebody finding out their status. These are often the same risks faced by the same gender loving people who either choose to disclose their sexuality or have their sexuality disclosed against their will. The risks, they risk loss of family ties and, and friendships. Folks are afraid they're going to get put out of the house or lose their job or lose their partner or their lover or their life. When you have those kinds of fears and all your life you've heard church folks say that you're going to hell for being the person God created you to be, when you feel like you're being persecuted, when you don't know where the folks who are supposed to be your friends are, when King Saul is trying to have you killed, that's when you climb back into the darkest cave you can find, crawl back deep into that closet, the place where we run to intending for it to be our place of refuge to end up becoming a place of confinement, a virtual prison. Let me try to make this plan. You might have heard about it on the news. A few months ago in September, a 28-year-old 28, 28 sister in Dallas, Texas, Cicely Bolden, was stabbed to death with a kitchen knife by her boyfriend after she disclosed to him that she was HIV positive. Mm -hmm. She killed me, so I killed her, is what he said. Mm -hmm. Cicely's seven and eight-year-old son and daughter found their mother's body when they came home from school that afternoon. Mm -hmm. How is a woman supposed to feel safe to disclose her HIV status? How can anyone? She killed me, so I killed her. Research done primarily with heterosexual couples where one partner is HIV positive and one partner is HIV negative has demonstrated that people living with HIV who take the appropriate medications reduce the risk of transmitting HIV to their partner by 96%. In addition to abstinence, monogamy, and condoms, we now have new ways for HIV negative people to protect themselves and for HIV positive people to prevent themselves from transmitting the virus to anyone else. She killed me, so I killed her. My brothers and sisters and young people who are at risk for or living with HIV more than 30 years into this epidemic <laughs> seek refuge in caves for good reason. Church, it's time we help them come out. When we help people get out of their caves, we help facilitate their ability to give God praise. David says, bring me out of prison so that I can give thanks to your name. The truth about God is that God wants us to praise him where folks can bear witness. Amen. First Corinthians 14, 16 tells us that if you keep your praise to yourself, if you only pray in your cave, how is a non-believer going to get to know God and say amen with you? Right. We've got to come out of the closet to praise the Lord. We've got to be able to praise him with our whole selves, completely. As church folks, we've got to create an environment where folks can feel safe enough to come out of those deep, dark places and give God praise. Right. At the International AIDS Conference this past July in Washington, D.C., 
Moses Ndahiro from Rwanda was giving this presentation on engaging men in HIV prevention using Rwandan churches. He said 80% of the people in the church initiated HIV support groups that they started in Rwanda were taking their medications 95% of the time. That's significant when you look at the numbers in the United States, where only 33% of the folks living with HIV are even on medications. If you look at African Americans alone, that's 29%. So if you're on effective treatment, you reduce your risk of transmitting the virus to anyone else by 96%. We can't get there if we're on 29% on men. If our brothers in the Rwandan churches, 95% adherent, only 29% in African Americans. We can get that number up, we can get the number of new infections down. Our brothers in Rwanda have shown us that the church can make a difference. Where we at church, the HIV Prevention Trials Network released some information this year from a study they did on black men. They called it the Brothers Study. Between 46 and 55 percent of the men in the study said they had some sort of religious affiliation. The brother that's analyzing the study that had told me over the summer that the preliminary review looks like a history of religious affiliation may be an asset with regards to reduced HIV risk. Where are we at, church? 87 percent of African Americans belong to a form of religious affiliation, but only 46 to 55 percent of these same gender-loving black men who are at highest risk for HIV infection. Many of whom have been run out of the church because of their sexuality. They sought refuge in caves and nightclubs and public sex environments and drugs and alcohol. They have sought refuge in caves and ended up in prison, just stuck, unable to benefit from what religious participation can give them both spiritually and physically. Where we at church? Amen. David in Psalm 141 on a positive note though, right? The righteous will surround me. So let's that sink in for a second. The truth is, that the righteous are called to surround the persecuted. That's right. The righteous will surround me. Everybody that works in HIV is always talking about the church. Every conference or meeting that I go to around the country, yeah. people are talking about how the church needs to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Groups representing people living with HIV and AIDS have called on the church. CDC has called on the church. Through this country's first ever national HIV AIDS strategy, President Obama has called, has charged federal centers for faith-based and neighborhood partnerships to actively engage faith <clears> communities to end stigma that surrounds HIV AIDS and to promote prevention and testing. The two-term 44th president of these United States has called on the church to play an active role in ending the HIV epidemic in our communities. And he's asked us to do a couple of specific things as people of faith. End stigma and promote HIV prevention and HIV testing. End stigma, end stigma, what is end stigma? You know that discomfort felt by folks who sit in the pews of churches every Sunday and hear about how they're gonna go to hell for being gay? or that HIV is a punishment from God, that's what we call stigma. Mm -hmm. yeah. It could be the threat of losing a relationship or a job or your place to live or your life. It could just be feeling like folks are looking at you differently or whispering behind your back or feeling like yeah. you have to hide a part of who you are and make people around you feel comfortable. President Obama is calling on us to help end stigma where we at church. Mm -hmm. Promoting HIV testing in faith communities is extremely important because one out of five people who are HIV positive don't know it. And the majority of the new HIV infections are transmitted by people who don't know their status. We've got to get tested, everybody. If you don't know you're positive, you don't start treatment early and get the added benefits of treatment as prevention. And folks who start treatment late die soon. <laughs> Knowing is half the battle. But in addition to testing, the president is also calling on faith communities to promote HIV prevention. Prevention is about promoting behavioral interventions like abstinence and monogamy and condom use as well as educating our folks about newer biomedical interventions, like pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, the pill that certain folks can take once a day to help prevent themselves from becoming infected with HIV, or the idea of treatment as prevention, that people who treat their own HIV effectively will prevent themselves from transmitting the virus to anyone else. That's real. If I take medication, so if the virus is undetectable in my bloodstream, then I won't pass the virus to anybody else. The president is calling on people of faith, us, to be a, to be a part of the solution in stigma and promote prevention and testing. But everywhere I go, people are still asking, where is the church? Yeah. Where are we at, church? Yeah. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. David is, in this case, stressed out. Yeah. In the Hebrew, the word for cares can also be translated as searches or seeks. So the person might read something like, I looked at my right hand where my loyal friend should have been because loyal friends customarily stood at one's right hand. But no man sought after me. In my East Oakland Ebonics, I might be like, I was checking for my homies, but nobody was checking for me. <laughs> the truth is that Jesus makes it clear where we're supposed to be, where we should want to be. You remember in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, when Jesus is trying to school his disciples on how to treat folks, right? 
You know, he, he talks about his second coming and how when he comes back, he'll separate the sheep from the goats, and the sheep at his right hand are going to get the blessing. It's a parable where he, where he says, when I was hungry, you gave me meat. Thirsty, yeah. you gave me drink. Strange, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. Prison, you came to me. I want to be on the right side of the sheep, right? Because he says, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's where I'm trying to be. Right. To get there, we've got to be the righteous who surround the persecuted. Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. We've got to be the ones on the right hand of the folks in those deep, dark caves. We've got to be the ones who care for their souls. We've got to be the ones to help those climb out of their caves so they can give God praise. It's not just people living with HIV and AIDS and the CDC and the president calling on us to do something about HIV in our communities. But do you hear what I hear? I heard Jesus say, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, for the outcasts, the lepers, the persecuted, the discriminated against the least of these, whatever you did for them, you did for me. Amen. You remember the, le the leper Jesus here healed in Mark 1, right? A leper came to Jesus, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Yeah. My Bible says, moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose. Be made clean. Hallelujah. Church, what do we choose? Hmm. Where are we at, church? This leper of an AIDS patient had probably been to all the doctors and politicians and support groups and free clinics and community based organizations and Ryan White Care Act programs in town, and he had heard about this Jesus. <coughs> this was the Jesus who had been going around town healing the sick and casting out demons. And this leper was supposed to be on the outskirts of civilization because the Israelites believed in HIV. I mean, leprosy was God's punishment for sin. This leper had the audacity to come to Jesus, fall on his knees and beg for help, and Jesus was moved with pity. Our people, our community is asking for our help. Where are we at, church? Are we moved with pity like Jesus was? Are we willing to stretch ourselves in order to reach those folks in the margins of society like Jesus did? The gays, the drug addicts, the sex workers. Are we ready to start clearing those caves so that God can give God can get the praise he deserves? Amen. Yes. If you think about it, David's cry to God in the cave was not unlike Jesus' cry to God on the cross. And they're both a lot like people living with HIV and AIDS and people in those high-risk populations who are crying out to God from the closet. David says in the psalm, With my voice I cry to the Lord. With my voice I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. He says in verse 5, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. David was a talented poet and songwriter. He was able to be all eloquent looking back on the situation in his cave, right? A masculine of David when he was in a cave of prayer. Jesus hollers from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lemme sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Same sentiment, right? Just a lot shorter. I mean, if you really look at Psalm 22, David writes the same thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Any child of God going through it might hollow the same thing, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People who test positive for HIV might hollow the same thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At 8.30 in the morning on May 16, 2005, the day after my first beta breakers, when my new primary care physician at Kaiser called me at work and said, uh, Rob, have you ever tested positive for HIV before? So after I picked my jaw off the floor, I didn't have David and Jesus on the tip of my tongue. I mean, I just started going back to church regularly a couple months earlier. I'd been abstinent for five months on purpose because I was changing my behavior. I had worked at HIV prevention education since 1999. I knew my risks. I knew how to protect myself. I knew a little bit about what it meant to test positive for HIV. After I got a phone with my doctor, I just sat at my desk, looked up, and said, well, God, what do you want me to do with this? I didn't feel forsaken. My pastor at St. Paul Andy Burke, the Reverend Williams, had just done a sermon series out of the book of Job, Bad Things Happen to Good People. When I tested positive, I was blessed to be able to go to a minister of my church and be supported spiritually. My mama had my back. I was in a good place, all things considered. A lot of folks don't have that. Where are we at church? Think back to when Jesus was crying out to God from the cross. Mary and Mary and Salome and some other women were watching from a distance, right? And after Jesus was dead and buried, they went to the cave that was barred for his tomb. 
They didn't sit around at a prayer meeting at the church and talk about what was going on in their community. And they went where they could be the servant. They came to see what they could do, not even thinking about how impossible their task might be. Armed guards and heavy stones and all that stuff. And this fight to end HIV, the perception is that black church folks have been watching from a distance as our brothers and sisters living with HIV have been crying out from their closets, their caves. We can try to make addressing HIV AIDS from within the church more palatable for some folks by stressing that women of color are increasingly affected by HIV. This is a serious problem. It's real. After African-American and Latino standard-loving men, women, women of color are the next high-risk group on the list. Most women of color who test positive for HIV are infected through heterosexual sex. That means women of color are having sex with men, mostly men of color who are also who are HIV positive. Now, whether these men are HIV positive because they also have sex with men, or they're formerly incarcerated, or they're injection drug users, or they're born HIV positive, none of that matters. The fact of the matter is that virus passes from HIV positive people to HIV negative people. And to end the epidemic, we have to find ways to prevent infection and prevent transmission. Yeah. Researchers have been developing pills and gels and vaccines yeah. to try to prevent HIV infection in HIV negative people. And science has confirmed that HIV positive people have a role to play. That's progress. We should acknowledge that worldwide there have been great successes in reducing mother and child transmission of HIV. Mm -hmm. That's helped in reducing new HIV cases by about 50% over the past decade in poor and middle income countries. We can preach the ABCs of HIV prevention until we're blue in the face, abstinence until marriage, be faithful if you're married. If you can't do A or B, use a condom. <laughs> the truth is that the most important factor in reducing HIV is not being campaigns to get people to use condoms or exam for sex. The executive director of the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, Michael Sidley, said, the most important factor in reducing new HIV cases has been focused on high-risk groups. So saving women in Vegas is always politically popular. Saving gay men, drug addicts, and prostitutes is not. Right. It's cool to talk about HIV in the church, but we really need to be out there like Jesus was, stretching ourselves in order to reach the outcasts, the lepers, those folks on the margins of society, where we at church. Yeah. For far too long, we've been sitting in the sanctuary waiting for those sinners to come on the church and get some of what we got. Hmm. We've got to be more like Marians and meet folks at the cross, go to the caves and help folks get out. It looks like a lot of work, right, in the HIV epidemic. That big old stone at the entrance of Jesus' tomb looked impossible to move to, but Jesus tells us in Matthew 17 that if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say that this mountain move from here to there, and what? It'll move. Yeah. And nothing will be impossible for you. Ending the AIDS epidemic is not impossible. Every church can do something right now, little things. Incorporate HIV prevention information into existing church and community events. And Imani, you set up a health information booth every year at the community street fair in our neighborhood. And this year for Women's Weekend, we included a video screening and panel discussion focused on black women and HIV. You can make HIV prevention education normal by including it with other health stuff. Keep a health information table set up with AIDS information as well as diabetes, breast cancer, nutrition, heart disease, every other element that there's a health disparity in African American communities. Folks will send you brochures for free, no cost nothing. We also take about five minutes during our services every fourth Sunday to talk about some health information for the congregation. It's usually something that's like a national health service that month or something in the news or some health issue that's affecting a member of the congregation. And remember, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do everything on your own to help in HIV in your community. Collaborate with other churches and community-based organizations and sponsor awareness activities. Think about maybe just focusing on a few specific days every year. There's National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day on February 7th, the National Week of Prayer at the beginning of March, National Testing Day at the end of June, and World AIDS Day at the beginning of December, which is where we find ourselves now, the second Sunday of Advent. The season of Advent reminds us that Jesus came to heal the entire world, regardless of one's condition or the depth of one's need. And while we're waiting for him to come back, we are supposed to be down here exemplifying the healing, hope, joy, and love in the world. Advent is a time when, when the world should be able to see the love of Christ in each of us. It's a time when all divisions cease, and only the love of Christ should be reflected. Nothing else matters, right? Nothing Jesus is love, and love yeah. conquers all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's neither strange nor unscriptural that the church would take a leadership role in fighting to end the HIV epidemic. Advent reminds us that Jesus was sent for this very purpose, and that he will return to judge the world and the church on how well we've actively carried out his message of love. Mm -hmm. Advent also reminds us that the church's own healing cannot come unless we are willing to partner with and work for the healing of others. Advent is not a time to play church. 
It's a time to be the church. All right. So where we had church, yeah. mm-hmm. this Sunday in recognition of World AIDS Day, we raise awareness about HIV AIDS in the black community specifically, but it also reminds us that Jesus came to touch and heal the ostracized of society, the outcasts, the lepers, the homeless, the sex workers, the drug addicts, the gangbangers, the immigrants, and the homosexuals, just as he comes today to heal and touch those of us that are living with HIV and AIDS. The gospel tells us that the good news of salvation comes through the person and works of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of deliverance from sins, penalty, power, and presence through the two advents of Christ, right? Jesus came the first time not only to die for our sins, but he lived to show us the way. Mm -hmm. The enlightenment or the truth that David shares in this psalm is that God is worthy of our praise. The truth is that we are called to surround the persecuted, the least of these. The truth is that feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and ending stigma and educating ourselves and our community about HIV testing and prevention are exactly the works that the sheep on Jesus' right hand are going to be blessed for when he comes back. Okay. This is second Sunday of Advent. Matthew 20, 28 says, he, cannot, he came not to be served, but to serve. Amen. So what are we here for? Yeah. What are you here for? Where are we at, church? Amen. Amen.